Rotor is a 1987 action sci-fi movie from director Cullen Blaine. The movie opens with Blue Steel? What is this, Zoolander? Or the movie with Jamie Lee Curtis and Ron Silver? Ah, right, it's just the alternate title. Anyway, they go to today's headlines. Oh, looks like they're doing time on the wild side. So, all these awful crimes today need tomorrow's solution. Robert Cop. Okay, Rotor, which stands for ripped off this poster right here. Their objective was to build the perfect future cop, but of course, something went wrong. Terribly wrong. Over in Dallas, Texas, Weenie and the Butt are talking to Turd, their eye in the sky with the traffic. Turd? Meanwhile, a couple are headed for a weekend getaway, which means that something will horribly go wrong. They come around the corner and whoa! They told the Foley to add in an explosion sound, but all he had in the sound bank was nuclear bomb. They see a guy and a woman are injured. Is it me or is this guy too big for this car? The woman's dead and the guy shows that he's a cop. Night sure comes quickly in these parts. Thankfully, this guy's rich, so he has an 80s gigantic car phone and calls 911. Just then, in walks over-enthusiastic ADR guy. Call. This old boy just killed a motorcycle cop. I seen him. Cowboy cop shows up to arrest the guy. They drive the cop into town so he can give a voiceover to set up the story. My name is Cold Iron. Barrett Cold Iron. My name is Fake Name. Ridiculous Fake Name. He's a police captain for the Dallas PD in charge of their tactical operations lab. He was in charge of trying to build the future of law enforcement to deal with the out of control crime rate. Oh wait, he's delivering his inner monologue out loud? Still another chance. Maybe it can be done. Just maybe. Sir? Sir, do you realize you're talking to yourself? Over at Division Headquarters, Cold Iron is being interrogated. <laughs> it's gonna be hard taking this name seriously. This ADR is on par with a Bruno Matai film. Or about 12 other high-crotched federales perched behind a two-way mirror. Are we sure this wasn't shot in Italy? Since everything has gone to hell, Cold Iron takes us to last week before all this happened. Whoever wrote this dialogue is laying it on thick. And a buttery morning sunlight painted a golden glow through the ranch house windows. Inside the house, Mr. Coffee is percolating away. Where the hell does the sun rise at 5 a.m.? Also, it's 5 a.m., his alarm goes off. And then it's 4.50. Cold Iron starts his exciting morning routine with OJ, pills, coffee, and more pills. The horse drinks the coffee and he eats the carrot. That's our cold iron. He's enjoying the old American pastime of blowing shit up. He gets a call from his girlfriend Penny, who he really doesn't want to hear. Barrett, am I in that stupid squawk box? Okay, so the movie established the sun is up at 5 a.m. He's now driving to work at 8 a.m., but the sun is still rising. I wasn't aware a sunrise took three hours. He goes to work, and what is he saying here? Ten years ago, when I founded the Dallas Police Tactical Operations Lab, our objective was to research, develop, and construct the nation's first invincible police force. Inside the building? Oh, please start breakdancing with the mop to impress the robot. This whole scene is so bizarre. I hope they brought the hydrogenated wheat germ and desiccated liver this time. You just can't get it anywhere like in L.A. Um... Wheat jam and desiccated liver, sir? Uh, what for? For my handball game, son. Desiccated liver and wheat germ? For handball? Then the scientist is mad at the robot for asking a legitimate question. Uh, yes, sir. Don't ask stupid questions. Over in the boardroom... Welcome back to Big D and DPD's Tactical Operations Research and Development. Oh, so this is the Big D I keep seeing all those cam girls talk about. Cold Iron shows them the Rotor project, which I think they made out of Capsella. He tells the board about the developer of technology. Another scientist, uh, Dr. Steele from Houston. Dr. Steele? Officer Cold Iron? Who's next, Professor Tungsten? He then shows them they figured out low-budget stop-motion animation. Okay, somebody's a big Beach Boys fan. Dr. Brian, Wilson Institute of Hawthorne. Is there some good vibration to its molecular tonality you can utilize? I mean, I get around, but I've never seen anything like this. God only knows this is spectacular. Who are we who create such a thing? 
heroes and villains? Next thing you know, you'll be yelling, Help me, Rhonda, on the way to our surfing safari. Cold Iron explains how the robots can do just about anything. Cold Iron goes to talk to the commander. No, not that commander. Commander Bugler. Well, I'll tell you who, doctor. Wait, he's a doctor now? I thought he was a police captain. I'm a captain with the Dallas Police Department. Bugler is mad at Cold Iron. Apparently they're way behind schedule on Rotor and it's upsetting the senator. Bugler tells them they have 60 days to deliver Rotor. Cold Iron tells them it's impossible and quits. Then he goes to the hospital so they can remove this stick from his ass. Uh, what's this guy doing? Cold Iron talks to his assistant and now he's in charge. Cold Iron then angry calls his girlfriend, Penny Shoulder Pads. The two go out for a dinner love montage. Back at the lab, Houtaling is messing up. The movie then gets a little too self-aware. What do you think this is, some low-budget sci-fi flick? This guy's hitting on a scientist who's not interested. His name is Shu Boogie? He accidentally jump-starts the Rotor project. Great, this guy is the reason a bunch of people are gonna die. The next day, Cold Iron is cooking Penny some steaks. Penny forgot something at the store, so Cold Iron goes to pick it up. Over at D&J's, Crocky's Deli Ice Picnic applies. These three gentlemen are up to no good. Cold Iron's criminal sense is tingling. 69 cents for a gallon of gas? A gallon of gas is cheaper than two tacos. Oh, magical days. He then does the old hide the gun in the newspaper trick, which he then uses to hit this guy. Minnows! Another criminal comes out with a hostage. He shoots him and <laughs> I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> Hours later, the police arrive. Uh, so much for steak night. Houtaling and the robot realize the Rotor project is waking up. Oh, I'm sorry. No, they don't. They leave and Rotor gets up. Oh, goody, Rotor vision. Why does the robot have a locker? Good thing, otherwise he'd be walking around naked. Apparently, he was never taught how to walk around things. Even though this super experimental robot was years away from being finished, they already have a motorcycle for it. I guess they were just forward thinking. Channeling a little dread, I see. Rotor drives out of the station to ruin someone's evening. Back in the lab, Dummy A and the robot have no idea what's going on. So Haltaling seems to have missed the giant flashing Rotor activated message. Later that night, a couple are arguing. This guy's being a jerk, which alerts Rotor. Rotor shoots the guy and goes to shoot the girl, but she distracts him with the horn and takes off. He chases her and meets his worst enemy, a closed car door. She drives away again and shakes him off the car. It's 3 a.m. and a cop finds the dead guy. Oh look, Rotor tagged his kill. They call Cold Iron to tell him. He gets up to investigate. Look at this tiny couch. Thought everything was supposed to be bigger in Texas. Sonia stops at a gas station for help. She smartly decides not to stay at the gas station, but how is Rotor finding her? Oh, this is some bullshit. What's this technology called? See the past? I could understand if there was maybe a security camera or something, but no. He's just looking into the past. Cold Iron goes to the office to see the Rotor alert. I guess this wasn't clear enough for the audience, so they had to add some titles in that don't even match. He then calls Detective Mango. This is Captain Cold Iron calling Detective Mango priority. Are we sure this movie isn't supposed to be a parody? Cold Iron hears about Sonya, so he goes to save her. But first, he calls the commander to tell him about Rotor. Sonya stops and goes into an all-night diner. Of course, Rotor finds her. Again with the past vision. Did they program him to be clairvoyant? He goes in the back and kills the cook with the fake buck teeth. He heads out into the diner for his villain shot. Okay, what third grader designed his logo? Sonya runs away. Then these guys try to fight him off, but fail. Why did he feel it necessary to do this? His WWF theatrics did nothing but delay his defeat for about five seconds. Sonya escapes into the building the production department built this morning. Rotor kills the guy and Sonya gets away. Rotor shoots a truck driver just as Cold Iron arrives. He tries to help Sonya, but gets knocked out. Cold Iron then uses his key thingy to try and shut him down, but it doesn't work. 
Sonya gets away and Rotor chases her. It's just gonna be this for the rest of the film, isn't it? Yep. Sonya Garen. Come in. Sure's a good thing she had a CB in her car. Sonya has to keep driving until Cold Iron is ready. Keep moving. Don't go home. Don't stop for help. Just keep moving. I'm going for help. I'll be gone, I don't know, a few hours. A few hours? I sure hope she has a full tank of gas. Cold Iron calls Steel, who is just auditioning for American Gladiators. That morning, Rotor recharges himself. All right, that's it. I'm convinced this is an intentional parody. Cold Iron goes to the airport to pick up Steel. They both design Rotor. This poor woman is driving all night being chased by a killer robot, while these two are very slowly checking into a hotel. Steel then gives them two tickets to the gun show. They head out to find Rotor. Okay, now they're in a hurry. Remember, you're the brains, I'm just the brawn. He's the brains? Sonya drives Rotor off a cliff and runs into the woods. She makes it to the old fishing lodge to meet Cold Iron. Is her outfit a lot lower than it was before? She tries to float away, but of course, Rotor stops her. Steel shoots him and Sonya gets away. The two fight while Cold Iron rescues Sonya. She didn't come all the way out here just to die, did she? I guess she did. Tony, help me, tie the primer cord off. Tony, get in the trooper. Tony, is he calling her Tony? Tony, Tony. Cold Iron ties the cable around him. The primer cord gets taut and blows up Rotor. Now back to the interrogation. How exactly did Sonya die? Also, this was morning, but the explosion in the beginning of the movie was at night, or at the very least when it was dark. He's free to go, so he quits the force, which he already did. On the way to the car, Commander Bugler shoots him. After Cold Iron's death, they send all of his notes to his nephew, who continues the Rotor project. Only this time, he's making it a woman based on Professor Steel. Rotor 2. Coming never. Rotor was shot in areas around Texas in October of 1986. Apparently, the film was supposed to be more comedic. Unfortunately, the director, Cullen Blaine, and actor Richard Geswin rewrote most of it, eliminating large portions of the humor and adding scenes in place of others that were too expensive to film. This infuriated writer Bud Lewis because it changed the entire movie. The movie was called Blue Steel in some versions. For the Blu-ray, the copy they found was the Blue Steel version, so that was the one they restored. The name is the only difference. Cullen Blaine was a storyboard artist for cartoons like Hong Kong Fooey and Spider-Man. Around this time is when he started going by Cullen Blaine instead of Cullen Houteling. Houteling was the name he used for the bumbling scientist. He was trying to break into film directing, but it didn't quite work out. He directed a few cartoons like Garfield and Friends, but mostly stuck to working as a storyboard artist or story director. While he wasn't cut out to be a film director, he did have a very long and successful career in animation. If you have a favorite cartoon from the 80s or 90s, there's a good chance he worked on it. The movie's become prime fodder to be made fun of. Riff Tracks, AVGN, Red Letter Media, Brandon Tenold, and in December of 2020 on a German TV show called Schlafaz, the hosts mock the film. Why? Because it's a bad movie. However, it is the right kind of bad movie. That magical balance of absurdly stupid and just plain inept. I'm kind of surprised it's taken me this long to get to it. It's been on my list since pretty much the beginning. What it isn't is boring. While what happens isn't exactly exciting, it'll keep you staring at the screen completely befuddled, trying to figure out what stupid thing they'll do next. I absolutely believe this was supposed to be a parody, but they decided to play it straight. How could you explain the absurdity in this? The ridiculous names like Cold Iron, Steel, and Mango. How there's these weirdly comedic moments that don't fit at all. Uh, you, uh, you gonna finish those fries? Plus the shifts in time, the bad dubbing, and the constant references to other movies. I got the feeling this is how Terminator got started. I really think they left in a lot of Lewis's comedy, but maybe just didn't realize it. You call the senator and you tell him Rotor walked through a busload of nuns to get to a jaywalker. Or maybe I'm really just reading into this too much and it's just a bad movie. 
I'd love to talk to Bud Lewis about this, but sadly he passed in 2014. I can't ask Cullen Blaine either because he passed in late 2020. There's really not a whole lot out there about the movie, and not many people involved in the film that are still around to talk about it. Still, I'd rather watch this goofy mashup of Robocop, The Terminator, and Judge Dredd than the Robocop remake or Terminator Dark Fate. Man was 39 years old before he discovered gravy wasn't a beverage. <laughs>